I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. Just a short and sharp episode this evening. Just wanted to bring you guys up to speed with Arsenal's pre-season friendly that took place earlier today. The Gunners were beaten by Premier League outfit Brentford by two goals to one at London Colney. We're going to be taking you through the match report, uh, sharing some thoughts on the game, why it's not really a result of concern for me. We'll be talking about the squad and various individuals as well. But before I do that, please make sure that if you're watching this on YouTube, you've hit the like button below and subscribed to the Chronicles of Aguna YouTube channel. If you are an audio listener, well, if you could leave us a uh, review, I nearly said leave us a subscribe. Don't know where that came from. Leave us a review uh, on the uh, on the podcast. That would be very, very much appreciated. So what happened today? Arsenal took on Brentford at London Colney in a pre-season friendly, played behind closed doors. The Gunners, uh, as I say, beaten by two goals to one. Eddie and Ketia getting the goal for Arsenal. So what does the match report tell us about this one? We saw our 100% winning record during pre-season come to an end as Brentford claim victory in a behind-closed-doors friendly at London Colney this afternoon. An early Brian Embuemo goal was cancelled out by Eddie Nketiah's fifth goal of the summer so far. But just before half-time, Brian Trevitt restored the B's lead, which they clung on to despite us dominating proceedings after the break. Just before I move on to go through the rest of the, um, of the match report, I just wanted to kind of share some thoughts on Eddie Nketiah. They mentioned there in the piece that it was his fifth goal uh, of pre-season. And I know that you shouldn't take an awful lot from pre-season and it isn't any form of guarantee with regards to how he might fare in the Premier League, in the Europa League, in the Carabao Cup, in the FA Cup. But it does give me encouragement that Eddie Nketiah's back in the habit of scoring goals. You know, I thought he ended last season really, really strongly. There were a couple of games where I thought, he wasn't quite in them as much as he needed to be, but I think that was more of a team issue than an Eddie and Ketia issue. I don't think you can ever question his commitment, his work rate, his willingness to do the hard yards. Um, and I think actually he's proven himself, although there's been a few bad misses, uh, quite a capable finisher uh, once he finds himself inside the penalty area. And I, I quite like the fact that although we all know that Gabriel Jesus is going to be the number one striker going into the new campaign and he is the one that we're kind of putting our hopes on and, and relying on. It's quite nice to see that Eddie and Ketty are scoring with regularity and showing himself to be, I don't know why I said regularity like that, regularity, um, and showing himself to be not an equal sort of level striker. There's, there's no question in my mind that Gabriel Jesus is on another level, but at least a, a capable one, at least a competent one, at least one that can come into the side and can still offer some threat. So again, I know it's a preseason friendly, I know you shouldn't take too much from it. I know you shouldn't take too much from the US tour either. But encouraging signs from Eddie and Ketia going into the new season. He looks happy. He looks settled. And I didn't know that that was ever going to be possible at Arsenal, given the speculation we'd heard with regards to his future in recent times. Uh, the scoring was opened after just nine minutes when Finn Stevens flicked the ball into the space on the right flank for Trevitt to race onto. And his low centre found them Buemo, who tucked past the outstretched Matt Turner. That goal came against the run of play, but we began to move through the gears. And after Marquinhos saw a low drive find Thomas Strakosha, parity was restored on 20 feet four minutes. Reese Nelson did well to cut inside from the left-hand side. And after linking up with Ainsley Maitland-Niles, the ball found its way to Nketia, who slotted home. Marquinhos again came close when Turner sprung a quick counter attack following a corner, but his attempted lob over Strakosha drifted just wide. Just before the break, Brentford got back in front when Rico Henry burst into the box and found Trevitt, who showed excellent composure to take a touch before picking his spot. After the break, it was one-way traffic as we peppered the Brentford goal, trying to find that equaliser. 
Nketiah dragged the shot wide before Albert Lekonga embarked on a mazy dribble before shooting just over the bar. We continued to up the intensity going into the final quarter and Nuno Tavares forced substitute goalkeeper Matt Cox into a flying save on 68 minutes before some neat play between Lekonga, Nketiah and Nelson carved out an opportunity for Maitland-Niles to head home but Cox was equal to his effort. With 10 minutes to go, Cedric let fly with a drive from the edge of the box and saw his attempt thump off the base over the post with one last foray forward. A wicked Nelson delivery narrowly evaded both Lekonga and Marquinhos at the far post, forcing us to suffer defeat for the first time this summer. So it looks as though actually Arsenal were the better side, um, despite obviously the result not going the way we'd have liked it to. It feels like Arsenal were very dominant in the second half. And and I've spoken to someone who was at the game um, and, and they basically reiterated the same point to me, um, that Arsenal were very much in control, that they did have a lot of opportunities, that they probably on the balance of play deserved to win the game. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Um, just going through some of the individuals in that side, um, looking at the back line, um, in fact, let me just tell you what the side was if, you, if, you ha- if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it yet. Uh, the goalkeeper was Matt Turner. The back four was Cedric, Walters, Holding and Tavares. Elneny, Lakonga, and Maitland-Niles made up the midfield with Marquinhos, Nelson and Enketia leading the attack. So that was the starting 11. Orr came on after 46 minutes. Souza came on after 76. Patino got five minutes at the end and Sago Jr., replaced Reese Nelson on the 90th minute. So those uh, were the changes um, made by Mikel Arteta. But let's quickly talk about some of the individuals. Look, Matt Turner, the more games he plays, the better. The more ready he is when his opportunity comes, the better. You know, the more able he is to kind of just pick up where Aaron Ramsdale's left off from, the better. Am I totally convinced about Matt Turner just yet? No. Am I totally convinced about his ability to distribute the ball in the effective manner with which Aaron Ramsdale does it? No, I'm not. But the more games he plays, the more accustomed he becomes to what it is we're trying to do. I'm not sure that playing behind Cedric Walters, Holding and Tavares is the best way to judge him, but it is what it is. He needs to get game time. He needs to get used to his surroundings, even if the back line in front of him in a competitive fixture is probably going to look completely different. Um, Nuno Tavares interestingly started the game amid reports that he could be on his way to Atalanta or somewhere else between now and the end of the transfer window. But the big kind of standout selection for me in the defence was Rule Waters. And I know it shouldn't be a surprise because he's featured really heavily in preseason so far. But this is a player who, for a lot of people, has come completely out of nowhere, for myself included. You know, I'd read positive things about him last season. I'd heard positive things about him. A player that uh, wasn't even expected to have an impact at under 23 levels just yet did so. And now he's getting his reward by having an opportunity in and around the first team setup. What will his role look like once the season starts? I don't think he'll be anywhere near as heavily involved, but this can only be a valuable experience for him, right? You know, obviously he's, um, he's, uh, he's gone on the US tour. He's got some minutes there. He played against Nuremberg, which is all great. What I would say is if you're a young player coming through the ranks and I kind of draw on, on an experience I had, obviously not the same level, but for example, when I went from playing Sunday league, to spending a little bit of time at Leighton Orient. I found it really hard when that time came to an end to go back to Sunday League and not have that feeling of, well, I've kind of tasted this now. I want to be back there. I don't want to be here. So I think that that's one of the things emotionally and mentally that somebody in Raw Walters' position is going to have to make sure he can cope with well in the event that his role is is no, not primarily with the first team setup, which I don't think it will be. So that's something that he's got to manage really well. And the people around him have to help him with that. But the fact that he's been given a look in, I think is really, really encouraging for him and his his future prospects. As far as the midfield's concerned, Elneny, Lekonga, Maitland-Niles, I've said it time and time again, this is the big problem area for me in this Arsenal side still. I know we've brought in Zinchenko, but the drop-off the drop-off between Xhaka, Partey and Odegaard as a trio in comparison to these three is huge. And it's still an area that we need to address. You'd hope that we'd never go into a competitive game with all three of those guys playing, or at least not one that we thought we couldn't get away with it in. Um, 
So, you know, again, am I going to read into that too much? Probably not. Uh, but the Patino thing is strange. You know, I mentioned there that Patino came on for Maitland-Niles with around about five minutes to go. And this is just a baffling one, right? Because Charlie Patino last year being dubbed as the next best thing, um, you know, someone who was literally knocking on the door of first team football, was developing very, very nicely, had a difficult game away at Nottingham Forest in the cup, but I don't pin that on him, it, nor has it affected my judgment of the young man. It was a difficult game under difficult circumstances. The squad was threadbare, um, you know, and he, he didn't have the right people around him to succeed. He was never going to succeed in a game like that. Um, but he didn't go on the US tour and obviously he didn't get a start here. He got five minutes at the end. Should we be reading into this? Is there something to this? Has Charlie Patino got an injury problem or an issue that we don't know about? Is that why he was excluded from the US tour? Is that why he stayed behind? Is that why he was used for just five minutes in this game, given what we'd thought was some real progress made by him last year? I don't know. I don't know. But it's one to keep your eye on over the coming months. I think we'll get a better understanding of where Charlie Patino fits in Mikel Arteta's plans moving forward. Uh, Marquinhos played from one flank, Nelson from the other, with Enketia through the middle. Um, just kind of reading through that match report, it seems as though Marquinhos was really heavily involved. Reese Nelson too, but I know Reese Nelson's got ability. I know Reese Nelson is is capable of starting for a lot of teams. I just don't think it's at Arsenal. And I think that it's time for Reese Nelson to move on. I think he needs to move on for the good of his own career. I, I think his game time will be severely limited at Arsenal, and, and that's just not good for a player of his age. He's earned the right now to go out and play regularly, I think. Um, you know, gave a pretty good account of himself at Feyenoord last season as well. But for me, Marquinhos is the big one that I'm kind of looking at in these types of fixtures. You know, what kind of role is he going to have? In my mind, when the signing was announced, this was very much one for the future. And he's not a player I expect really to have an impact at first team level next season. But just looking at that, just looking at that match report and and based on the conversation I mentioned that I had earlier today, it seems like he's settling in really, really well. And that's encouraging, isn't it? Because sometimes for young players coming from far away lands, it can be difficult. Um, you know, Lucas Torreira seemed as though he was settling in brilliantly at Arsenal at the beginning. He was playing well. He looked happy. And we all know what happened there. So I'm not going to kind of get carried away or, or count my chickens before they hatch. But obviously the fact that Marquinhos seems to be involved in proceedings quite a bit when he is on the pitch. Suggests to me that he's an impact player. Suggests to me that he's someone that can, um, you know, really, really push on and, and perhaps be the competition backup, whatever you want to call it, for Bukayo Saka. Maybe not straight away, but certainly in the next six, 12 months. Maybe that's why Arsenal have called their interest in a winger based on what we know. Um, you know, and again, I say based on what we know, because there are a lot of reports out there that suggest Arsenal is still looking for one, that Arsenal is still going to go and sign one between now and the end of the window. And people referencing the fact that we were in for Rafinha or at least considered, according to Edu, a move for Rafinha suggests a willingness on Arsenal's part to do that type of deal. I just think for me, um, don't put too much pressure on Marquinhos. Like, I, I don't think... He's at that point yet, but equally, if you do go and bring in a winger and you knock him further down the pecking order, yeah, competition is great, but is that helpful? I wouldn't be surprised if looking at him, Arsenal have decided that actually maybe they don't need to go and invest big money in a winger right away. And that if they can make do for a bit, they'll be okay with the Brazilian. But who knows? Who knows? Um, you know, I'm still of the opinion that I wouldn't be surprised if a, a loan offer came in for Marquinhos in Europe. Um, between now and the end of the window. And if Arsenal said, go on, go out there, cut your teeth, play regular football. I don't know. Just my, my. Um, again, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So, yeah, but good to see him obviously impacting the game and being involved. I mentioned Eddie and Ketty earlier on. I, I won't go into that again. Uh, but yeah, just some, just some brief thoughts there on Arsenal's game against Brentford today at London Colney behind closed doors. The Gunners beaten by two goals to one. Nothing to worry about, I'd say. Um, all the focus turns to Saturday now. Bit, um, I was going to say a big game. Big game in terms of as far as pre-season friendlies go because it's the last one before we kick off our campaign next Friday at Crystal Palace. It's um, it's an opportunity for um, 
you know, the players to get that little bit more match sharpness, match fitness. I think it'll be a very different team that starts that game to the one that started today. Uh, so looking forward to seeing some of those guys in action. And, and the nice touch I saw on Twitter today is that there will be a minute's applause on the ninth minute um, in honour of uh, Jose Antonio Reyes. Obviously, um, very fond of um, him and, and, uh, and he was one of those players that I was... You know, sometimes when you sign a player, you find yourself willing certain players on more than others. And um, and he was certainly one of those. I really wanted him to succeed, really wanted him to do well. And even though it didn't quite work out as we'd have hoped at Arsenal when he did go back to Spain, I was always kind of rooting for him and hoping that he'd do well because I really liked him. And thankfully he did. You know, he had a really distinguished career. Unfortunately, he was taken away um, from the world far too early, um, which is a shame. But it's good to see that two clubs that obviously hold him in very high esteem are going to be uh, putting on uh, some sort of tribute for him at Emirates Stadium on Saturday. So if you are there, because I'm not going to be, please do um, give him a clap for me. Don't forget to leave a like on the video. If you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you're new, if you're listening via audio, don't forget to leave us a review. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. And we'll be back very, very soon with more Arsenal content. Until next time, take care. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.